Howdy, Ags. Uh, welcome to today's lecture. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the educational theory applications within youth development. And so let's go to our first slide. Um, and you'll see here, you saw this model uh, previously in, the, in one of the last lectures. And it's the, the interrelationships that uh, these theories and principles have in common with both education, youth development, and child development. Uh, we've kind of already gone over this in the past. If you need a refresher, uh, it is in a previous lecture about how these work together. I just wanted to just pull this up here so you can take a look at it uh, and just be reminded on how they work. And also, let's look at uh, reflection when we talk about and we can reflect on how these work together. Remember, it's a practice, a process, and a philosophy. So let's take a look at uh, the practice here. So education and learning theories can help a staff understand how to better teach and lead youth. And there are many that can inform your educational design and approach to programming. So you need to consider these when you are undergoing the task of creating your curriculum. Uh, the selected one I have here is uh, Bandura, that's Albert Bandura and his social cognitive theory, and we'll get into that here in a minute. But there's also other, uh, other theorists that we can take a look at. Uh, B.F. Skinner, uh, someone who's well known for operant conditioning. Uh, and as I'm going through this, by the way, you're not necessarily having to memorize who these people are or what they've done. This is trying to give you just an overview of what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, if you have interest uh, in other classes, you probably will go over these. But um, So then we have Kolb and Dewey uh, and their work in experiential education and inquiry-based learning. Uh, we'll kind of go over those here in a second. Uh, Gardner had his uh, multiple intelligences as well as uh, Viskoski. Uh, have his prax uh, proximal zones and scaffolding. And we'll go over each of those here in a second. But remember, these are just to kind of give you an overview at how some of the theorists look at uh, how people learn, um, what they learn, and how they incorporate that into their being. So social cognitive theory, this is our first one. Um, and we will kind of go over this. So Albert Bandura came up with this idea that, uh, you know, youth are proactive, they're self-organizing, self-reflecting, and they self-regulate and determine how they are shaped by their environment. Uh, this is called self-determinism. Excuse me. This is called relational determinism. And so there are no two children that are alike. And as a youth worker, you must be able to adapt and adjust based on the unique characteristics of uh, the child. So every child and every person for that fact brings with them uh, many different inter interpersonal and interpersonal influences that make a difference on how they react to, say, a program. So how you process and what happens to what you're seeing is, is very individual, okay? And what I mean by that is you see here you have personal determinants, you have environmental determinants, and you have behavioral determinants. So for one example, a personal determinant may be um, a person's disposition towards uh, music, right? So someone uh, who enjoys music, who maybe has a, uh, what we'll get to earlier or later as a musical IQ or a high degree of musical learning, they're going to react in one way versus someone who may not have as high as a disposition towards music. Maybe they uh, are more active or maybe they're more sedated or something along those lines. So they don't uh, they don't necessarily see programming or the opportunities the same as someone who has a higher disposition towards music. Um, sorry if this sounds kind of confusing. It's, it's very deep when 
getting into what social cognitive theory is. But basically, who you are affects how you relate to others, how you relate to the environment, and how you relate to um, just different things in life. So going about a process, um, you know, child development theory draws on the human development and dimensions of a child. Um, while there are a few listed, there are many here to consider. These theories should give you uh, a guide as the age appropriateness of the activities that are planned. Um, some of the names that you may have heard of are like Kohlberg and their moral reasoning or Piaget and their cognitive development. Uh, Erickson is a, a is a large one when you uh, is a giant in the field when you want to talk about psychosocial and uh, again you're not necessarily going to have to know who these people are but these are people who have worked uh, with uh, talking about the development of a whole person and uh, they have some interesting ideas about how people are influenced And we get to the philosophy. Uh, and so how philosophies of youth development refer to the guiding principles that programs can use in designing their quality experiences. Um, our example here is uh, the ecological uh, theory model by Yuri Braffenbrenner. Uh, there are some others that you've learned in other courses and this one alike. You know, we've talked about the 40 developmental assets that people can have. Uh, those are both internal and external. Uh, a previous lecture, we had the essential elements of positive youth development by 4-H. Uh, and those are just some of the, uh, the different examples of the philosophy that can guide designing experiences. But uh, for kind of a more detailed approach, let's take a look at Broffenbrenner's uh, approach to ecological theory. And you may have seen this, this model before. This is the ecological model. It attempts to acknowledge that there are many different factors which a child brings into a program or an activity and how those factors uh, affect all aspects. So first start with, uh, it first starts here with the person itself. And you can read here that a person can be greatly influenced at the individual level. Think about how gender roles influence you Maybe how a person's genetic makeup, like their height, their size, again, their disposition towards different things. Each of these has uh, an effect on a person or within a person. So then take that idea and move beyond the first uh, inner layer. And you can go to the microsystem and maybe how uh, youth's friends and their peer group might influence them. Um, maybe it's a prior experience that they've undergone and how that influences the way they see things or react. And uh, interaction like these happen at each and every level and they affect children and their developmental development uh, greatly and individually. And we're pretty much saying the, the same thing. Each child is different. Each child has experiences. Each child has influences that maybe they they either did to the, have on themselves or maybe they were put upon them. And so each of these is going to affect a child differently. So let's take a look at learning then at how education theories can influence how you design your curriculum. Um, being literate in these frameworks is especially important if you're trying to tie your program into uh, say school curriculum objectives. And we previously mentioned, mentioned experiential education and inquiry-based learning. Uh, but along with learning styles and multiple intelligences, we'll go further into detail about these. So here's kind of your, your, your big overview of experiential education. And as we read, it's based on the concept that children learn best when they're active participants in their own education and are more likely to retain knowledge and use it in other settings. Remember I said Kolb was the one who came up with this. Um, you know, it broadly supports youth constructing their own learning 
about their experience. Uh, and here you see the wheel that kind of goes through. So a person has this concrete experience. So if you wanted to use, um, let's just think of a, a rec activity like um, mountaineering. Let's take mountaineering as a concrete experience, right? So they go out into the woods, they have all their supplies and they have their compass and they're going to try to trek from one point to the next, right? So they, they, they undergo this activity and they finish it. So when they finish it, they reflect on what they, what they learned and how they did. And they understand, well, they could have done things better or they need to account for X, Y, Z. And they start thinking about how those things will influence future uh, activities within this engagement, this mountaineering example. And so they start putting that into abstract conceptualization, uh, thinking about going forward. And so then they test that the next time they're out and they, they try new things uh, and see if it has an impact on their, uh, on their experience. And, if, you know, it's a feedback loop. Uh, what you go through, how you reflect, what you think about going forward and then trying it again. And then the, it goes circular and everything keeps going. And as you experiment and you grow and you reflect, these things just keep happening. Inquiry-based learning is an approach to learning that emphasizes a student's role in the learning process. Rather than a teacher telling students what they need to know, the students are encouraged to explore the material, ask questions, and uh, share ideas. And so, however, the example that you're sitting in right now is a lecture, and this is not an example of inquiry-based learning. However, I prefer to use inquiry-based learning, and, but it's very difficult to do online, and it's very difficult to do uh, without you being in a situation with me and being live as a group in which we can ask questions of each other to get more information. So you're actually on a very old method, which is the lecture. But the inquiry-based learning is, uh, is very similar to what you might think of like a science fair project. The important factors consider that youth determine what they want to learn and the process uh, that they will use to learn it. So they construct their own learning about the phenomenon, they can use scientific process skills to gather evidence. Uh, and then based on the evidence, they begin to reason why things happen. They start evolving the ability to uh, think about how they may know the subject. It's very hands-on and it's active. And uh, the core is you start internalizing this knowledge of what you know as you, you're very hands-on with it. Now we move to, uh, to learning styles. So in the next few slides, we're going to cover how, uh, how co excuse me, in the next few slides, we're going to cover uh, the various different learning styles. So just as a refresher, all youth learn differently. Adults uh, often tend to structure their learning experiences according to their, their learning style preference, meaning you figure out how you learn best, therefore you try to use that method to learn. But it's important to understand that youth may not have this uh, knowledge, nor may they have this experience. Uh, and so it's your responsibility as a youth worker to, to look at examples of all of these uh, and incorporate those into your programming. So we have visual learners uh, who visual learners rely mostly on sight and prefer seeing things written down. They often use pictures and maps and charts and other learning tools. Uh, people who fall in this category, they remember things best by seeing them written down. Uh, and they often are observed kind of like doodling or drawing. There's, there's some kind of connection with, between the written and their, their memory. Auditory learners are those who learn best by listening. So. They prefer demonstrations, liter uh, lectures, videos, discussions. Reading aloud uh, sometimes is very helpful. They remember best through hearing or saying the items. Um, 
And you actually, uh, you may see people who are youth who are observed reading out loud to themselves. And then you have the, the kinesthetic learners, the tactile learners. They learn best through touching and feeling and experiencing. Uh, these type of learners prefer uh, role playing, uh, doing experiments or simulations and other hands-on activities. Uh, and they remember best when writing or physically manipulating the information. And so within this learning styles, uh, you begin to start having different types of intelligences. And Garner proposed uh, this idea of multiple intelligence. Uh, and there are eight, I believe, and here are the first four. Um, and I'm not going to go through each of these, but you can see there's, uh, there's four here, the visual, the verbal, the mathematic, mathematical, and the, the bodily uh, types of intelligence. Visual people, uh, visual intelligence may see things in action and be able to order them uh, spatially. A verbal may think in words rather than pictures. Mathematical intelligence uh, may be able to think conceptually in logical and numerical patterns. Uh, may be able to make connections and piece together things. Uh, bodily or kinesthetic intelligence. Uh, these are intelligence like such as body control and able to handle objects, you know, skillfully. Uh, people who express themselves through movement uh, generally have a high kinetic or uh, kinesthetic or bodily intelligence. And here are the, the last four. So we have musical and interpersonal interpersonal and naturalistic. Uh, musical, you know, is thinking in sounds and rhythms. Uh, intrapersonal is trying to understand their inner feelings, the dreams, relationships with others, the ability to self-reflect and uh, be aware of one's inner state of being. Um, we often talk about a person's emotional intelligence uh, and some of that comes between intrapersonal intelligence as well as interpersonal intelligence, uh, trying to see things from other people's point of view, like uh, empathy or sympathy. Uh, they often try to promote collaboration, working cooperatively with others. And then we have uh, naturalistic intelligences. And so this is the idea that uh, learning through classification, uh, categorizing things, uh, being able to understand, relate to, comprehend, and explain things within the world uh, through this sense. And so the next slide is kind of a, or the next two slides, I should say, are kind of a one-off. Um, they don't really fit in what we've been going over earlier but I think it's important to take a look at when you are program planning. Um, and so is the, first is the concept of scaffolding, and you may have heard this before, uh, but here is a, a visual represent, representation of the zone of proximal development. And so don't get really bogged down in the name of it. It's a very simple concept, but it's something you need to look at. So. In the center, we have the, an activity or a concept that a learner can do. They can do it by themselves. They can understand it. They're good to go. They can perform it, whatever the task may be in the situation, so they can do it. Um, and then the outside circle is this activity is too far advanced and beyond their abilities or too far beyond uh, them to cognitively understand what's going on. Uh, but then you have this this middle tier here. This, uh, this is where it kind of bridges the two. And this is what scaffolding it, it, at its heart is really talking about. Scaffolding is bridging the two from what a person can't or can do to what a person can't do through the aid of help, right? Through the, through the aid of guidance. So this is often talked about as a plus one theory. So I can move generally uh, one level 
beyond what I'm able to do if I have help. So I may not be able to cognitively understand something on my own, but if I have one person explaining it to me, then I can reach uh, that understanding. So this is scaffolding is a is a very important topic to consider. And lastly, uh, we talked about child development. I said this is kind of a one off, uh, and I really want you to just take a look at uh, at these three these three important uh, facets here that we have within child development and how how they play a major part within children interacting. But the takeaway here is understanding and applications to child development theory and practice are critical for program success. Or maybe a better way to say it is, it's important to remember that while a child may be physically mature for his or her age, he or she may not be at the same stage cognitively or psychosocially. And you can think back to your to your youth days and when you may not have been at the same, uh, you may be considered the same age, but people were mature or immature uh, at different rates. And so that's what I want you to take away. So those two concepts are, are two that I wanted you to remember. So let's take a, a look at our practicum. Uh, this week I'm trying, or this module, for module three, I'm trying to uh, give you an opportunity to to listen to someone else for a little bit. So I want you to watch the video, the TED Talk by Peter Benson and how you thrive. And I want you to take a, uh, take the five most compelling takeaways uh, from that video in your opinion and write them out and discuss them, okay? Uh, so pick your top five and then tell me why they are. And then your end of module three here is uh, I want you to take the same schedule that you had in module two and, uh, and take a look at it and determine creative and engaging themes for your program. So what might you do on an overnight camping trip? How you, how you may theme the event. And then on your schedule, identify activities that support this theme. You use what you've learned today in this lecture and about educational theories to help plan those activities. Uh, and be creative. That's what I'm looking for you to do. So you're just adding to what you've previously done, okay? And lastly, as we wrap up this lecture, you know, here's that opportunity is, what is your role and what do you play in, uh, within youth development? Sorry for a long lecture. Uh, I hope to shorten it down, uh, but this is the end of Module 3. Uh, good luck, and I'll see you in the next lecture.